Welcome everybody to the 2021 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. Our next session is titled Cultural Factors in Livestock Emergency Management, a comparison between local farming communities in volcanic areas and external emergency preparedness approaches. This is going to be presented by Dr. Marjan Lindman from Diversity Focus uh, in cooperation with uh, Ms. Oh, engineer Eva Jordans and Dr. Katinka de Ballon. The session, this session is proudly sponsored by Public Safety, the Public Safety Institute. It's a privilege to have Dr. Lehman present today. Her bio and abstracts are really interesting um, and they are available to read from our website under speakers. Before we start, some basic housekeepings. Housekeeping. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled, so if you want to uh, uh, pose questions, please use the questions and answers feature and we will uh, do our best to uh, answer at the end. Uh, we encourage you to use the hashtag GADMConf on Twitter and social media. Short evaluation will be available when you exit uh, the session. And just as a reminder, the video recording will not be available until it has been edited and in some cases translated. Um, and they will be released as part of the GAD Mac Award ceremony in July. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Lehman. The floor is yours. Thank you, um, Gerardo. And hello, everybody. It's uh, nice to join this conference. Um, our presentation is on a research that we did um, with regard to culture, livestock and volcanic eruptions. These are topics that usually are for experts far apart, but in emergency preparedness, they come together. So we had to deal with it. Um, and FEO is currently implementing a project in Indonesia, the Philippines and Vanuatu. Uh, and that's funded by USAID, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. And this project looks into addressing live, livestock in emergency planning for volcanic eruptions and ensuring people's livelihoods. With the lessons learned from this project, hopefully other countries can benefit. Um, and as part of that, uh, we looked into evacuation reluctance by local residents, which occurs despite efforts um, to bring people into safety. So what I will be doing is uh, I will talk a little bit about natural disasters. Uh, after that, uh, we will show the research questions. And then we talk about culture. And as part of that uh, livestock, um, I talk about it separately because, well, it's, it's livestock emergency, but we consider it to be part of culture, being the domesticated animals. And from that, the studies that we did, we develop a framework and after that we conclude. I've put up uh, four pictures here. There could have been more because there are more types of disasters. Um, each and every disaster has its own experts. We have water managers, we have yeah. people. Sorry? Um, oh, okay. We have people uh, dealing with climate or volcanoes um, and they have all their expertise, but with disasters, uh, it actually matters what type of disaster you have and uh, the onset, whether it's slow or fast or the duration is long or short or the scale is wide or not so wide. Uh, that matters for risk assessment and therefore also for emergency preparedness. And that has consequences for casualties, human as well as animals. Uh, to give you a little bit of a background on volcanic eruptions, it affects residents living on the slopes, but it also affects people beyond the danger zones. And in the last 30 years, we have seen that um, the impact of eruptions has grown, especially in Southeast Asia. And this is due to um, population growth a, char a characteristic of volcanic eruptions is that they uh, have a high level of uncertainty. You, uh, well, one doesn't know whether it will erupt or how severe the eruption will be. 
uh, whether the wind will be towards the village or away from a village. Uh, and the other characteristic is that um, this is such a, a dramatic event that it can have severe psychological impact. People do not only stand to lose their lives, but also everything that gives meaning to their lives. And from this uh, unpredictability, uh, together with this, uh, well, this threat, one would expect that people would be eager to evacuate as soon as there's any sign of an eruption. But it's quite the contrary. Pe people are reluctant to leave. They remain with their animals, their crops, their assets, return even, and they hold on to myths. And that for us was reason to look into this. The research questions. Um, our first question was, how do cultural, including uh, psychological factors play a role in evacuation reluctance prior and also during volcanic eruptions. And we broadened this a little bit by also looking into the meaning that volcanoes have for the residents and uh, also the livestock. What is the meaning of livestock for the residents? And our second research question um, is how to design livestock emergency preparedness plans in a culturally sensitive manner. Um, if you're not working with volcanic eruptions, it's easy to overlook how many there are, really are. The majority are in the ring of fire, which is around the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and on these volcanoes, there are about uh, 1,500 or so that are active volcanoes in the world. Um, there are several villages, and all these villages, they have their own cultures. Uh, it's undoable to look into each and every culture and all its variety, uh, especially, well, volcan uh, volcanic cultures usually are very rich and diverse. Um, so we had to go by another approach and we are seeking to look underneath the culture. And then we had to start with defining culture, but culture, well, most of us, we know what culture is, but we find it very hard to, to determine what it is or to de define what it is. And that's because it's a phenomenon like justice or love or leadership. It's not something, uh, it's not a thing, it's a phenomenon. And then you end, easily end up in philosophy, but that's not what we're going to do tonight. We, um, the way we approach it is uh, people are born into a culture, like you're born into a language. It is shared with you in the, the social context that you live in and you pass it on. But it's not restricted to the family or the communities. It also happens in school, in university, in the jobs you work, the organization. And this social context has an environment, a natural environment. And from that environment, people must make a livelihood and they must protect themselves from danger. And whether this is a natural environment or a city environment, this is what is constantly driving the values and the strategies that communities have. And communities that have lived uh, in a vol volcano environment and lived through a disaster will have developed coping mechanisms and they must have given meaning to, um, well, their environment and what the volcano meant. They have developed values. And that has resulted in very, very rich cultures. Um, I don't think I'm the person to tell all the stories and myths and legends that came from this. Um, but in the top right, we see people involved in a ceremony uh, on, uh, related to Mount Merapi. Um, on the bottom, we see uh, animal sacrifice, Mount Bromo. And to the left, the two circles of the bird is a, a story, a legend that is actually only 130 years, uh, 35 years old. Uh, relating to a canoe that was spotted, uh, a phantom canoe, uh, which became a story and then became a myth. Then we have Pele from Hawaii and we have Maria because in ca Catholic um, countries with volcanoes, often processions are held to ask for protection. And then I have in the legend of Majon, just as an example, that it can be told in very different ways. And people 
uh, although they um, have their own religions, they tell these um, stories uh, about the mountain because it resembles um, a legend which is, is um, uh, well, well, how shall I say, it? it's, it's, it's a Romeo and Juliet story about a prince that is going to marry and, uh, but is not allowed to marry and then uh, there's a fight and a war and one died and the other uh, kills it, uh, herself. And you, once, uh, when, when Majon then um, erupts, people see this story happening again between love and war. Um, to move on, let me see. These myths, they come from what Cashman and Cronin call psychological unbelief. Um, they have looked into um, eyewitness reports from the 1980 uh, St. Helens um, eruption and um, also, um, excuse me, uh, Soufrière in 1997. And what they saw is that people could not really um, tell what they had seen because an, an, a mountain that uh, explodes more or less is not something that we have words for. So they would then uh, explain what they saw in terms that are metaphorical or supernatural. And when a story is still young, there are also the features like the grass was black or uh, it was like um, there was snow coming uh, from the air, which was black. All these analogies are told, but when the story grows older, then those features fade and the supernatural and the more high, high, uh, high, higher power responsibilities, they become stronger. And that's how a myth comes into being. Um, Jasper and Duncan also uh, looked at um, stories or reports uh, on, um, excuse me, <clears throat> on reports. Uh, and they saw that of 51 of the reports that they went through, that 35 had deistic responses. Um, and usually a mix of them, syncretic. So between monotheism, polytheism, or anatism, and even humanism. And in polytheism, we don't, in the stories of monotheism, we don't see like um, kings or spirits, but we see protection. And there is protection like with Maria that I just mentioned. And when we look at animistic religions, then we don't see kings and courts, but we see ancestors and local features. And the mix of those, they come from layers, from all the layers uh, of culture. So, um, okay. Here we, we, we answer our first research question, which is, um, there are indeed psychological and cultural factors and we see them in five categories religious beliefs um, relying on traditional coping systems mistrust of outsiders uh, compromised resilience which means livelihood problems or for instance infrastructures that are no longer there economic markets that have collapsed and also the, a phenomenon which is called perceived immunity. That's a false sense of safety. In the face of danger, people still feel safe because they have been living in that situation for so long. Um, as I said, livestock also is given meaning. Um, it can be a food item, it can be economic, it serves economic goals. It can also be social, that means that it uh, enhances social status or reinforces social relations. And abstracted means that it has, uh, it gets a symbolic um, meaning. This can be cultural or religious. And affectionate is just love for a particular animal or a species. And we see um, these more prevalent in certain production systems. And the replaceability, which means that um, an animal can be, if it's just food, it can be replaced by other food. But 
uh, it becomes harder to replace the animal if it becomes more unique uh, and has specific qualities, then it becomes irreplaceable. And in term, uh, for social um, meaning, then if the quantity matters, the, the gift, gifts uh, that, that have to be exchanged, then it should not take long for the re replacement, otherwise it's also disturbing. For the abstracted role and the affectionate role, um, the loss of the animal can become more traumatic because uh, it really uh, has a psychological impact. Uh, and we see this not only for farmers, I mean, this, this was meant for farmers, but we see also pe people uh, in government often give economic value to animals. The public more and more uh, gives an abstracted or affectionate role to animals and that changes how we look at these, um, well, evacuation or slaughtering, etc. Now we've come to um, working through, uh, through towards our framework, um, working with communities in a particip participatory intercultural way um, has advantages. Um, and then we first start with looking at, uh, because we as experts, we also have culture. Um, and our culture, we are trained to, uh, to look at situations in terms of problems, and then we're trained to analyze them or solve them. And with that, we easily overlook people. Uh, if we put on a cultural lens, then we look at the, the whole context rather more than just the problem. And that includes people. And if we want to be people oriented, then we have to, have to also distinguish between, for instance, men, uh, women, disabled, poor, because they're differently affected by disasters. So working together and with community in disaster management, it is a challenge, but it's necessary. Um, to point out the differences that we also have about emergency preparedness, um, to start with the, with the right column, the, the, the purple and, and gray, as experts, we often um, tend to save as many lives as possible. That's, that's our aim. Whereas farming communities can be more worried about livelihoods or um, keeping livestock. They do the trade-off between risk and livelihood. And as experts, we usually focus on just doing the risk. And so then the, you have a different goal. Working together with a different goal is difficult. So you have to attune together. Then also that implies that we also have different methods to, um, to look at. Uh, emergency preparedness. From science, we have a tendency to deal with uncertainty, um, to inform ourselves, to generate knowledge, and then it becomes a risk. And then we can deal with risk. We can calculate it, we can model it, we can anticipate it. Whereas in local communities, uh, this is not available. And they work more towards avoiding uncertainty. And they lean on uh, beliefs that they have all the information by oral tradition. Um, and then they accept. Well, I can't say they accept. No, I shouldn't say that. But um, from that, there's also a difference in how we communicate about emergency and risk. Um, as, as experts, we have a, 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 a concentrated view on knowledge on um, managing so we have a tendency to concentrate all the information and from that center we give it away to well we spread it again so it's a top-down approach whereas in villages um, these lines of communication are much more varied and um, like shadow networks um, we had a look at a few studies and from those studies we learned how these communication uh, structures work and what they're based on <clears throat> and then we see that scientists generate the knowledge and they communicate to government government have their own interpretation and also interests and, and policies about it and they officially communicate that to in the direction of the diverse communities um, 
what then happens is that these communities they also have their own communication within the community and around the community and it depends a little bit on how much they trust the government and how much they trust their own information and rumors and what have you whether they trust the official information and do the right thing or they just distrust the official um, communication and do something else um, what's remarkable is that the scientists and the local communities, they do not really have um, a channel for communication. Um, then an example from Ecuador, where this trust and communication uh, was restored. And they, it, it had been a long time uh, since, uh, before 1999, it was a long time that they had an eruption and then they weren't very well prepared and it ended up in a chaotic forced evacuation and that caused a lot of distrust in authorities as well as scientists. Um, so um, the official channels and the villages they didn't communicate or work together and the scientists then reached out to these villages and they created with the villages because they well villages and scientists they noticed that they were actually natural partners both having knowledge on the volcano, be it different but complementary, and they started a, a shadow network. Um, they developed a common vocabulary, and in that way, they um, established a link between the formal, more state uh, oriented, or more state derived uh, communication uh, um, channels and, and, and policies, and the informal community way of doing things. Then the stream of information wasn't just top down but also bottom up uh, which inspired the government to decentralize their uh, mitigation centers uh, closer to the villages um, and it became people centered and the people um, they they told that they that their livestock that they wanted to evacuate with their livestock and other things that they needed like good shelter and uh, in fact, they wanted their livelihood to continue uh, when they would evacuate. Um, so the government invested in that and then um, this trust was built and there was a constant communication channel with the scientists rather than the governments. The governments was, were supporting, but it was the village that would um, choose the risk tolerance, the hour of evacuation, and then within a few hours they would completely evacuate. Um, so note that the, uh, the livelihood continuity and trust and agency are important uh, to be able to do this. Um, <clears throat> here we look at a village level emergency plan. It is adapted from Donovan uh, on a uh, research that she, that she did with, uh, in two villages on Mount Merapi. Um, what what can be seen is that if the onset of the volcano eruption um, is fast then they do their internal communication and their action and there's no involvement of external communications via government or whatever in yellow i've uh, I've, I've made them uh, the chances for um, the villages to hear outside information uh, are, are in, in yellow. So if the eruption is not so sudden, the information of the government and the traditional signals that they lean on, they're put together and they are weighed against each other. And the second moment comes when the alert levels go up. So they have to prepare for evacuation. So there is a unique chance for um, experts to connect uh, in this way to the develop the emergency plans of a village. Um, don't look at all that's written in the framework. Uh, it's just to, to highlight um, um, how this works. What, what we learned from this study is that participation and communication is key uh, to be able to work together. Because if you have different goals or different methods or whatever, you, you need to exchange those things and to connect so that you can do it together. Um, the other thing that was um, um, 
but pregnant, or how, how do you say it, it was, was prominent, is that livelihood and social capital are weighed in the risk analysis of uh, local people. Um, and it also has an impact on the resilience and the way people can go through a disaster. So it, it's really something to, to address. The other thing is that um, people in, in communities, they also have a learning loop. Um, and in, in this work together, you should also have that. So what is learned after an eruption should feed into the new preparation. And in blue, I've uh, put the, the priorities for assistance um, because a community needs uh, outside assistance with shelters, uh, with strengthening livelihoods uh, and with communication uh, channels. So there's still a lot of work to, do, to be done for experts. It's not uh, completely a self-evacuation. And in this project, that's what, uh, what people are working on. And we're looking at Bali here. And in purple, you see um, the um, livestock densities uh, portrayed. It's not yet disaggregate for uh, livestock species. But this type of intelligence helps to, uh, to choose for, for, for good e evacuation spots. And, and so that, 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 that it adds up. Um, it can also feed into the plans that communities have. So um, let me see. So we've come to the conclusions um, with regard to livestock emergency preparedness. Um, it's essential to uh, to facilitate livelihood continuity, and not just to focus on risk avoidance. Um, and the assistance, like I just said, for impl implementing innovative adaptions, um, evacuations, insurance options, etc., and healthy livestock, also important. Um, and then generally augment livelihood resilience and social capital and animal health. It's, it's different from life livelihood continuity. What I mean by this is that the resilience of livestock, uh, of, of sorry, of livelihood and livestock should also be pre-eruption so that um, a community can withstand the disaster better. Um, the, with regard to the people-oriented and culture-sensitive uh, approach, it's the framework that is actually the conclusion uh, of our work in this. Um, what can be helpful is multidisciplinary teams. It broadens the scope uh, and it broadens that you can connect to what is happening in, in the communities. And I would like to stress again, the people-oriented approach involves um, looking at gender, looking at poverty, etc. So um, I've come to the end of my speech and um, there's one message in particular that I would like you to take from this and that is that we have different perspectives um, and what uh, that that makes it that makes it necessary to commun communicate to the other, and to the other I mean the one that you don't know yet, um, and for that you should especially listen. We as experts may have the tendency because we know we're trained to know something about something to teach, uh, but in this respect, uh, we are the pupils because we need to learn from the people what is driving them, what, uh, how they assess their risks, etc. So I want to thank you. Um, I hope I kept up with the time. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, if there are questions, I would like to hear them. Thank you, Dr. Lenneman. First question is, could you explain your research method and how you engaged local communities in this process? Oh, um, that's a very good question. I don't think I, 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 I said what we did. We did a literature review uh, from more than one um, body of literature, uh, managing, uh, leadership, um, ju just everything that dealt with these uh, issues. And, and we took case studies uh, of um, studies that were particularly here to an emergency um, uh, response. 
So it's literature, 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 literature that we did. And we analyzed them and uh, we analyzed them again. And then we came to this framework. So that's how we did it. We, we were not in the villages. The uh, researchers that we studied or the work that we studied, those people had been studying uh, in the villages. So this could be seen as a meta research, a meta analysis. Does that okay. answer the question? There is uh, another one. So uh, mm -hmm. let's go with the next. Um, okay. there, is a, there is a comment that says many applications to us in the US and California where we have uh, big cultural divides. And okay. um, yeah, go ahead with that, please. Um, how, how do I understand this? The, the cultural divides between what and what? It, it was a comment. Beautiful presentation, many applications yeah. to us in California where we have big cultural divides. Oh, all right. So it's a comment. It's not something for me to answer yes. on. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you very much. And, and the next question is, how do you plan to proceed with the framework to apply it on the ground? Um, uh, how do I plan? I, I don't have the plan ready yet. We are happy to have come to this stage. Uh, I think it would be good if it would be tried out, uh, for instance, by NGOs or um, people who are working with uh, emergency res response. And maybe what I didn't say is, um, or forgot to tell, is that we think that emergency response starts with the people and the people um, involve on the agenda, livestock is important to evacuate or other things that they might choose. Um, so, um, yes, I, I think it, it could go for a, for a field trial. Thank you. Um, I believe uh, Dr. De Balong is interested in, in, uh, in commenting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yes, so also in the beginning, uh, my colleague, Dr. Lene Mans, she mentioned the project that currently is being implemented is due by the Food and Agriculture Organization in Philippines, Indonesia, and also in future in Vanuatu. And part of it is also a case study at the different uh, volcanoes that have been selected to be studied more in depth. And this is Merapi and Agung in Indonesia and Mount um, uh, Tal and Mayon in the Philippines. And here actually communication with the different uh, villages will be conducted. This is part of the project, but clearly with COVID-19, this has been delayed but currently the plans for uh, field work is, are being prepared. So clearly this framework will be very helpful to take it into consideration when we're doing these studies on the ground. Thank you very much. Um, if, if that's the um, end of the questions and answers, I thank um, our good doctor for her great presentation. And um, I'd like to remind you um, as well of the next uh, presentation, which is going to be supporting older people with pets in evacuations through emergency fostering in Cairns. This is going to happen in, in, a, in two hours time. Thank you very much to our presenter, to our presenters you. and to you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now.